بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ربي زدنا علما وربنا فقهنا في الدين قل آمين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رجال لا تلهيهم تجارة ولا بيع عن ذكر الله وإيقام الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة يخافون يوما تتقلب فيه القلوب والأبصار ليجزيهم الله أحسن ما عملوا ويزيدهم من فضله والله يرزق من يشاء بغير حساب صدق الله العظيم How are you guys all doing? All right. So, uh, last time, we talked about the Battle of the Trench, Al-Khandaq. We talked, or Ghazbat Al-Ahzab as it's known, the Battle of the Confederates. We talked about how the, the different Arab tribes were all gathered by the Jewish tribes, and how they all were able to besiege Medina, and through the tactic of building a trench, the Muslims were able to basically besiege themselves within the city. They were able to protect themselves. We talked about the dangers of... Uh, of like the siege, we talked about the betrayal of Bani Quraidah, we talked about what their fate was after the battle, and we talked about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was able to essentially beat them, beat the Ahzab himself. The Muslims, they had very little to do with how the actual battle ended. We talked about how they didn't really have a hand in much of the de-escalation of the battle. They did what they could, but at the end of the day, a lot of that effort went through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, yani, help and through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's assistance to the Muslims. And then we talked about how after that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, from here on out, نَحْنُ نَخْزُوهُمْ وَلَا يَخْزُونَ We conquer them and we won't be conquered. And we begin seeing this right after, the, uh, right after the Battle of the Trench. After the Muslims basically got everything back together in the city, they began sending conquests all over the, uh, against these tribes, against the confederates who went against them. And essentially the idea was, alright, you guys uh, try to attack us, let's see how you guys deal against us. And it's also a good defensive tactic because a good offense is a good defense, right? If you, you know, you could, you know, a team could score a goal on you, but if you score 10, you're good. So here the Prophet ﷺ led many, many, many conquests during this period, right after Al-Khandaq. And many of them went pretty well. However, during one of them, there was a minor incident. So basically, again, during the, what, when the Muslims are going, when the army is going, generally they'll stop at a well or a valley or something just to replenish their power so they can drink water, uh, get the resources back, what have you. So during one of these conquests, there was a well that was basically that the army was meant to share. So a man from Al Khazraj went to get some water, and a man from Al Aus also went to get some water. And they went at the same time and they basically had a bit of a, they had a bit of beef. And then one of them cursed Al-Aus, the man from Al-Khazraj cursed Al-Aus, the man from Al-Aus cursed Al-Khazraj. And then both of them pulled out their weapons. And when this army saw this, now obviously the army is mainly composed of Al-Aus and Al-Khazraj, Al-Aus started coming to defend their man, Al-Khazraj started coming to defend their man. And now within the, own, within the army of the Prophet, now there's two tribes ready to fight each other. And over what, like, yeah, I mean, and keep in mind, this comes, we talked about this, I think, in the very first halaqa, last semester. We talked about how the Arabs had a sense of pride in them. They had this sense of honor to their tribe, which worked pretty well because it showed us how they were able to defend Islam through all of the battles. But it also has its negatives, and we see them right now. Uh, the Prophet, ﷺ, when he heard this, he got really mad. And then he went out to the army, and he's seeing... Two lines being set up by Al Aus and Al Khazraj, and then he shouts between them and he says, Do you use the slogans of pre Islamic ignorance when, while I am yet amongst you? And I am among you, and khalas, until you've been given this message, you've been given 
the way to treat your brothers you've been given the, the word of Allah is this how you're going to treat the word of Allah after it's been given to you and here the prophet says leave it for indeed it's detestable do good from brother to brother you know I, I, I like to think that every single one of us at one point in their life had their own uh, age of ignorance their own period where they didn't see things very clearly their vision with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with, with their religion was very cloudy and they may have sinned or made a few sins or done things that they're not very proud of right now. Or you might be even in that period right now, Allah wa'ala. But with Islam, it gives, us that, it gives us that guide. And once we see it, there's no reason for us to go back. Or at the very least, it's good for us to know where we left the age of ignorance. There needs to be a line that we draw that tells us, all right, after this, there should be, there should be no, more, there shouldn't be any more ignorance on our, on our ends. And yes, you may go back to it time to time, but as long as you're keeping yourself straight and you're trying to apply the words of Allah, then inshallah may Allah guide us. And same thing here, yani the Prophet والسلام, he looks at them and he says, "You guys are brothers." لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحبه لنفسه. None of you will love. No, none of you will truly be believers until you love for Allah what you love for yourselves. Yani, when we look at our different races, when we look at our different cultures, this isn't a point of difference. If anything, it's beautiful. Do you not find it beautiful that I speak a different language than him and I look different than him and I have different genetics than him or her? Yani, is it not beautiful when we look at each other and we look at the different cultures and the different languages and the different cuisines and the different elements of different cultures that exist and how even through all that we're united through one religion? The Prophet tells them to leave it. Leave this pre-ignorant pre thoughts of tribalism and culturalism and racism behind because at the end of the day, يعني, we're all created from one creator. Allah does not make a black man better than a white man and he does not make an Arab better than a non-Arab. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's what the Prophet was mentioning. here. And beyond that, you see that right now, it's very easy for a brother to tell his brother, you're my brother, or a sister to tell her sister. And I mean like, like Islamic sister or Islamic brother. You're my brother, you're my sister. But how many of us actually act by that? How many brothers can you actually sit next to and tell them about your problems? Where you, and you tell them about, hey, I had this issue in my day. I had this problem. How many sisters can you go to or you can just talk to? And they would help you. So. How many brothers would you immediately call? When you have an issue in your day. How many? Because it's easy for us to say we're brothers. And even outside of this community. When you look at what's happening to our brothers in China or Palestine or India or where, where have you. Where, wherever a crisis is happening. Do we care to open up the news at the very least just to read about what's happening to them? Are they not our brothers? Are they not our sisters? Are they not our brothers? Are they not people that we want to make sure that they're well, that they're good, that they have all of the resources needed where we can help them as much as possible. Saying somebody's your brother isn't something you should take lightly. And it's not something you should throw lightly. It's something you need to act by and mean. Should turn blue. Sorry about the technical difficulties, everybody. projector <laughs> All right, sorry about that. So the Prophet de-escalated the situation and now the news started spreading across the entire Muslim camp about what actually, like what happened. And one of the people who this was spread to, one of the people in the army was Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. Who did we say was Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul? We mentioned him before. Who was he? The Munafiq, the head of the Munafiqeen, the head of the hypocrites. This man was mentioned in the Quran so many times, not in a good context. 
yani you, you don't want to be mentioned in the Quran the same way he was mentioned. And when he got this, he was in a camp with his other, uh, with the other munafiqeen. And, oh, how it worked, it worked, it worked. And he began calling out the Prophet ﷺ, and he started saying things that were heavy. I'm not going to mention a lot of them, but at the end, of the, but at the very end, he says, he said, Indeed, the most honorable will expel themselves. Uh, they're sorry, they're from the meaner, which basically just says that we're gonna the people who are currently in power, the people who are currently as we will be expelling them as if they were much less significant. Essentially saying that the Prophet is going to be shunned out of the city as somebody who's weak. And this was very heavy, Andy. This isn't uh, a statement that would be taken lightly, back, especially back then. So the Prophet ﷺ, when one of the Sahaba was, with the, was within the camp, and when he heard Abdullah ibn, Ubay, ibn Salud say this, he went to the Prophet who was with his companions, with Omar specifically, and he heard him, and when he was told about this, Abu Bakr, he came, Omar, he said, yeah, and he told the Prophet, let me cut off his head. Yeah, and he, this, isn't, yeah, and he, this, is, this isn't a game. He's spreading, yeah, and he's spreading fahish. He's, he's possibly causing an issue. The Prophet told him, yeah, and he, leave him. Leave him because what would the people say? Would, like, if, if, if you kill him, the people will say that the Prophet Muhammad is killing his companions. He's killing his followers. And here the Prophet saw an insight because yes, he's a hypocrite. And he's saying things that are basically treacherous. But he's, a, but he's a Muslim. He says he's a Muslim. So I had to treat him as one. Now one of the people that was in that camp was Abdullah ibn Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. The son of Abdullah. Uh, the son of the hypocrite. Now keep in mind, ironically enough, while Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul is the head of the hypocrites, his son was one of the most beloved companions. He was a very honorable companion and he had a lot of situations with the Prophet. When he heard that, and keep in mind, he was very very good to his father. Even though his father is the head of the hypocrites, he treated him very well. Kambar, as we say. But when he heard this, to him, yes, he loves his father, but he loves the Prophet more. He told the Prophet, if, if, if you want to, so we, because again, if Umar ibn Khattab kills him, now we've caused an issue. But if I kill him, he's my father. I can deal with it. It's family. So I'll say it's a family issue. Let me deal with him. The Prophet told him to leave. But this didn't, like, this didn't leave Abdullah ibn Ubayim, like, Ab Abdullah ibn Ubayim, so he still had that hatred to his father because of that. So what he did is that he raced, when the army finally left to Medina, he went ahead of the army, and he got to the gates of Medina, and he took out his sword, and he waited. The companions would come through, and he'd let them in, and people would come through, until he got to his dad. Once his dad came to Medina, he pulled out his sword, he put it in front of him, and he said, I won't let you in. Taban. Abdullah ibn Ubayim Salul was confused. This is his own son. And keep in mind, again, he was very good to his father, so he, this is abnormal behavior. He said, yeah, what's wrong with you? He said, I won't let you in until the Prophet lets you in. And he stayed there. And he stayed in front of his father and he wouldn't let him in. And when the Prophet got news of this, he told Abdullah to let him go and to let him in. Taban, this annoyed Abdullah ibn Ubayim Salul. And he caused him to have retention against the Prophet ﷺ. And he wanted to get some sort of revenge. Now meanwhile, while all this was happening, something good to understand is how like, the caravans of the army move. So the Prophet ﷺ, sorry. The Prophet, uh, sorry, the army of the Prophet ﷺ, and armies in general, what they would do is that they would move in a line. So they would essentially like, kind of how we did the protest today, how we moved in a line, same idea, more or less. And when they camped, they also camped in like a straight line. And the reason is, it's just because it's a desert. So if you're moving in a straight line, it's just faster and easier. But there's an issue with that. First of all, if an army were to flank you from the right or left, you're good. Because the army is already lined up. So if somebody comes from the left or right, you can just encompass them on either side. But if an army comes from the front or, God forbid, the back, you're in a, it's, it's, it's a pickle. Because now they, they just have a whole line that they can just cut through. And it's an army, so they'll be able to do it easily. And from the back, it's that and you're being flanked. So what the Prophet ﷺ would do, or the, the armies in general, what they would do, is that they would always keep one man at the front of the army and one man at the back of the army. The man at the front of the army, his job was just, again, to make sure that there's no threats and nothing. And if there's anything, he would go, come report it back. And if they wanted to send a message to anybody in front, 
he would be the most ahead, so he would get the message and he would uh, go. And the person at the back, he had two jobs. First of all, he would check that they're not getting flanked. And second, he would make sure that the army didn't leave anything behind or anyone behind. Which is important here because the Prophet ﷺ, something else he would do, is he would always take one of his wives in any conquest that he went to, or any battle. And generally his wives, they would be there for him to, to be with him and uh, to also help the sick, to nurture anybody who got tired. And even the wise prophet, they would always like, uh, they would have like a raffle and they would pick one of them as to who would go. And for this specific battle, uh, Aisha went. So Aisha, keep in mind, she, she's very young. And she narrated her, this herself. She said she was also very light. And what the prophet's wives, they would always be on like a, kind of like a saddle on top of the camel, kind of like a mini hut that they would place on, kind of like that, where they would place on top of the camel and they would stay in it, basically being covered and they would have their own privacy. So she needed to go to the bathroom. And with the men, they would kind of go somewhere in the side, but with a woman specifically, they would go really far away. So she went, she did her deeds, and then she came back. And then she realized she was missing like a necklace that she had, and she really liked it. So she went back to uh, where she went, she looked for it. And when she found it, she, went, she came back to the place of the army, but then she found out the army left. The men, they, once the army started moving, they carried that saddle, and they were placing it back on the camel, and because she was like, they didn't feel as if she was on it. So they thought she was in the saddle, so she, they put it on, they left her. So now Aisha's back, uh, like where the army was, and she, yani, she started panicking. But she said, yani, it's either I die, or I stare and somebody finds me. So she sat and she waited. And uh, people also say that she cried until she eventually uh, fell like asleep. Now, she says she was awoken by a man named uh, Safwan ibn Mu'tal. Safwan ibn Mu'tal was that man that we said would always stay at the back of the army. So Safwan, he passed by, and when he and she said she woke up somebody saying, "Inna Allahu Inna Ilaihi Rajiun." Safwan had assumed he knew it was Aisha, but he assumed that she was dead. So when she he saw her wake up, what he did is he got off his camel, he uh, told her to get on. And then once she got on, he took the camel, took the rope, and he started going. Khalas, and simple as that. And they got on, they got all the way to Medina. Nothing too major, right? Who saw them enter into Medina? Abdullah ibn Ubayim ibn Once he saw him, keep in mind he saw that contention with the Prophet. He said a word that stuck with the rest of the Muslims, with the rest of the city. He said, Lam yanju minha. She was not freed from him and he was not freed from her. Basically implying that they committed adultery, more or less. He implied it, he didn't say it. But this word stuck with the people. And it started spreading all over the city. And the word got to the Prophet ﷺ, who was astonished. Yani, where did this come from? Why would the... Yani, Aish, yani, but here the Prophet, yani, when he knew, the, and he knew who gave out that word, which was Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salul. And, but he didn't know what to do. And at the same time, the entire city is talking about it. Meanwhile, Aisha, she, after she got back, she said she fell sick. And she would stay at her house. She didn't know anything. About, she didn't know about what was being said. And according to her, she felt something was weird. Yani the Prophet, whenever she was sick, he would always... Take care of her in a special way, but she felt like it was less caring during that time. And, and uh, subhanAllah, and, and, uh, my brother, whenever I'm sick and he takes care of me in a specific way, I'm like, yeah, that's normal. If he doesn't come back, like, that's normal, you know. But with the Prophet, even, even, the, yeah, even though he would still come and take care, but, yeah, but, but he just felt like there was, it was less intense than what it actually was. So she asked that she be taking care of her parents' house. And she didn't know any about the rumors being spread out. Now the Prophet ﷺ, he was, he was astonished because minus the fact that he's being harmed in his own household, yani, there's a rumor being spread about his own wife. From a man that has harmed him numerous times. But he didn't know what to do. So he came out, he brought the uh, Aus and Khazraj. And he asked them, yani, yani, ma, ma, ma ben rajulun yudhini fi, fi ahli. Like, well, what, like, what's this about? What's going on? Yeah, well, why am I being harmed in my own house? Now, Al Khazraj, now keep in mind, Abdullah ibn Abayya Salul was from Al Khazraj. So Al Aus came and they're like, Ya Rasulullah, if you want us to deal with uh, the man who said this, if he's from Al Khazraj, we'll deal with the entire tribe. And he's from us, we'll deal with him too. And then Al Aus came, they're like, 
you know that he's from us. So, oh, sorry, al Khazraj came and they said, you know he, he's from us. That's why you're saying it. And then the, the two chiefs of al-Khazr al -Khazr started beefing again. So the Prophet's like, yeah, you guys didn't even help me leave. You dispersed them. The Prophet would come with a prayer. He would get out of his house. He would go pray. He would go back and he wouldn't talk to a single person. And during this time, trade was uh, stagnant. Uh, no, uh, there was no wahi. There weren't any verses that were revealed to the Prophet during that time. The state of the city was just yani, in a recession. And this is Allah, yani, this is min ghadab Allah, yani, this is part of the punishment of Allah. When we see people causing issues and causing yani, fahishas around, around us. It's normal for us to see stagnation, to see recessions in things outside of that. Yani, whenever we're dealing with rumors, when we're dealing with people who, in yani, Egypt for instance, a common term that we say is al wadda shmail or al-bint di shmail. Say, يعني, and we'll talk about يعني, the, 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 the contentions of that, but when, you're, when that's what you focus on, how are you going to progress in other factors? The entire city was so focused on this one thing, they forgot about the other things that they should have focused on. And then the Prophet, he went to two companions. He went to Usama ibn Zayd. He asked him, what do you know about Safwan ibn Mu'tal? He said, I know nothing except good about her. But what do you know about Aisha? I know nothing except good about her. He bought Zayd, uh, uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib, sorry. He asked, what do you know about uh, Safwan? Nothing, I, know, I, I only know good about him. What do you know about Aisha? He thought, he thought, there's only one thing. One time I gave her dough so she could take care of it and I was going to take it back from her. But then she kind of like, she, she may have like lost conscience, like she may have like lost focus. So one of the like cattle that was around, it ate that dough. That's the only bad thing I know about her. Bro, I'm on my seventh phone charger with my sister. <laughs> and that's the only bad thing that he knows about Aisha. Bad. Quote unquote bad. But then Ali, and he told the Prophet, yani, there's a lot of other women. You're, yani, and this is causing you a lot of harm. Yani, you're not obliged to stay with her. And by the way, Aisha says that she held this against Ali for the rest of his life. Yani, keep in mind. And then he said, yani, ask her mate. The Prophet asked her, I know nothing except good about Aisha. Nothing, yani. And here we see, and keep, keep in mind, the Prophet knows who this rumor came from. Why is he still concerned? Yani he knows that this is a munafiq. I know it's a munafiqeen. And here we see the ayah, If somebody you don't trust comes to you with information, check. He might be right, but most likely he's wrong, but check. And we see that the Prophet, even when he knows this man is the worst person in the entire city, he's still dealing with him like he's a Muslim. The division that we cause between each other because this man isn't too religious or this man isn't uh, too good for us, you can't do that. Anybody comes from you, no matter what their, religi their religiosity is or no matter what their background is, no matter how, what their level of knowledge is, you must take them to the account of their word. They tell you something, you must take it as a fact. And if you don't completely trust them, then check. Eventually, Aisha, she, once she started getting better, and she needed to go to the bathroom one day, she left, and generally women, they would, I don't know, I, it's subhanAllah, it still happens to the day, but like women generally go in groups to the bathroom, which, uh, yeah, I don't know why, but uh, this was the case here. And uh, Aisha went with a woman called Umm Mu'tim. And when she was with her, eventually Umm Mu'tim, she kind of had like a, she was frustrated with something, so she cursed out her son. Mu'tim, by the way, was a man who was in bed. And Mu'tim was one of the people who was spreading, out, spreading the rumor. Aisha, she's like, why would you say that? He's one of the companions that helped the Prophet in bed. and respect him. And he's your son. Umm Mu'tim, she's like, you, you don't know what he says about you? She's like, keep my, she knows nothing. About Umm Mu'tim, she told her every single detail. Aisha was shocked. All of this is happening under her ear. She goes back to her household. She asks her, her yeah, keep in mind, Abu Bakr, keep in mind, Aisha is Abu Bakr's daughter. Yani minus, yani the Prophet's being humble, so is Abu Bakr. Uh, so Abu Bakr and his wife, they, they're like, yani, we don't know. We don't know what to say. And then the Prophet came. And then 
Here the Prophet, he told her, first of all, he testified that there's no God except Allah, and then he told her, if you're innocent, Allah will acquit you. Otherwise, you have to beg for his forgiveness and pardon. To me. Aisha, she, not only do her parents not trust her, her husband doesn't trust her. Or like, it seems like he doesn't believe her completely. So, yani, can you imagine the emotional yani, incarnation that she, would, she felt during that time? She began crying so much and she said, I'm never, ever going to do tawbah for this. Because I didn't do it. And she said, if I were to tell you I am innocent, and Allah knows I am surely innocent, you will not believe me. And if I tell you I'm innocent, it's like, yeah, it's like, I didn't kill this guy. It's like, okay, now we got to prove it. But if I tell you, and if I would admit to something of which Allah knows that I'm innocent, you will believe me. And if I tell you I didn't steal this, you're going to have to check. And if I tell you I did steal it, then you're, in, you're, you're guilty. So there is nothing for me to say except for a few words, uh, except for the words that the father of, of Joseph said. Keep in mind, she, uh, she's referring to Yaqub here. But she was so sad, she couldn't even remember the name of Yaqub. So she said, the father of Yusuf. And she said, so for me, patience is most fitting. And it is Allah alone whose help can be sought against which you assert. While all this was happening, eventually, the Prophet ﷺ finally began revealing, a revelation was given to him. The Abu Bakr and Aisha know when this happened, so they left him. And eventually, Surah An-Nur was revealed. Surah An-Nur talks about this entire thing. But in it, it reveals Aisha's innocence. It said, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ جَاءُوا بِالْإِفْكِ عُصْبَةٌ مِّنْكُمْ Really, those who have brought forth the slander against Aisha, in this case, are a group, um, a group among you. Basically saying that this is slander. It's not true. And while this was, while the Prophet was giving the trouble, Abu Bakr was terrified. So Aisha wasn't. Because you know she's innocent. Yeah, if you know you didn't do anything wrong, yet yeah, you're accused of something, why are you worried? Allah knows you're innocent. And eventually you're going to be shown, even if everybody against you thinks you're guilty, and rule you as guilty. Allah knows you're innocent. And, <laughs> and Aisha, when uh, after this was revealed, and Surah Nur was revealed, she, Abu Bakr told her, yani, go thank the Prophet. He's like, I'm not thanking him. <laughs> I'm not thanking him. Thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's not the one who gave me innocence, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And wallah, yani, when we see how the Prophet dealt with his wives, and dealt with the women in Medina, you know, yani, once Abu Bakr, he came to the Prophet. The Prophet was in, a, in an annoyed state. So Abu Bakr wanted to cheer him up. He came and he said, Ya Rasulullah, our women have become more dominant over us as a joke. What does he mean by that? In Mecca, the way that the men of Mecca treat their women was very strict. They were much harsher. And even after Islam came, yani it's just the culture of the city. But they were very harsh. Meanwhile, in Medina, the people, they were much more lenient with their women. So it was normal for a Medanese wife to be much more argumentative to, uh, you know, to demand things from her husband and what have you. So when the Sahaba came and when the Muhajireen came and they started seeing that the females of Medina started treating their uh, husband, like the way they were treating their husband and how the and even the Prophet was very lenient with his wives. When they saw all this, they themselves started gaining their own yani, uh, second wind. And they started, yani, Abu Bakr said, yani, once I was, I was retributing my wife over something, and she spoke back to me. I was like, what is this? And keep in mind, yani, the Prophet ﷺ says, خيركم, خيركم خيركم Beating your wives, doing all these things, they're, they're completely prohibited. You must deal with your wives with respect and honor, and women with respect and honor. This goes from the men to the women, and the women obviously to the men. But I say that to the men to the women first, because الرجال قوامون على النساء. And something else, yani the Prophet, he would always find where his wife would drink from, and he would drink from that same location because yani, he wanted to show how much they, he loves them. And he even told Aisha, you know, I know when you're mad at me. He said one, he's like, when you're mad at me, you swear by the God of Ibrahim. And when you're not mad at me, you swear by the God of Muhammad. But minus all that, you know who the Prophet never lost love for? Khadija radiallahu anha. His first wife. The wife to his daughters and his sons. And he would always remember her. Wallahi, when we look at how the Prophet dealt, again, you want to look at how to deal with anything. You want to look at how you be a leader. You want to look at how you can be a husband. You want to look at how you can be a teacher. Look at the Prophet. In any matter. No matter what it is.
And once this was revealed, there were three people who were stoned. These were the main corroborators of the fahsh. And by the way, they were all companions. Each and every single one of them. The Prophet said, if you come with something like this, similar to what I said, like somebody says, hey, I've seen this guy with a bunch of girls, he's probably sleeping with them or what have you. Do you have four witnesses? Do you? Because that's a massive claim. You think it's small, but it's massive in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Take care of your tongues. Because that right there could be your gate to heaven or your downfall to Jahannam. And take care about what you say about other people, even if you don't see them. And the three people, one of them, by the way, just last thing in regards to this, was a man named, uh, yeah, yeah, Mustah, we talked about him. And by the way, one of them was Hassan ibn Thabit. He was the poet of the Prophet. Yani, these aren't yani, yani, Sahaba that we... Mustah ibn Thabit, he, Abu Bakr used to give him like money, basically, because he was very poor. Or part of the Muhajireen. When he heard that he was spreading rumors about his daughter, he's like, I'm not giving you any money anymore. And on the Prophet, he said, وَلَا يَأْتَلِ أُولِي الْفَضْلِ مِنْكُمْ وَالسَّاتِ أَنْ يُؤْتُوا أُولُوا الْقَرْبَ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَأُولِي الْقُرْبَ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Basically telling him, pardon them and give them from your wealth. Do you not want Allah to forgive you? And then Abu Bakr replied, I want to be forgiven. SubhanAllah, Abu Bakr forgives. A man is talking about his daughter in this context of slander. And yet he forgives him. SubhanAllah. Now to the actual main thing. Hudaybiyah. Now, basically, after all of this and after the conquest, the Prophet, he saw a dream where he entered... Mecca and he was doing Umrah, more or less. So he's like, alright, we're going to do Umrah. But, yani, uh, Rasulullah, we were, yani, we're on our third battle with Quraysh. We're entering into a fourth. He's like, we're not going to battle. We're going to do Umrah. All the Arab tribes can go to Umrah. We're going to do Umrah. Simple as that. The Prophet is like, yeah, Rasulullah, yani, ihna, we've, yani, we just came out of Al-Khandaq. It's, like, it's not a safe environment for us to start doing conquests. The Prophet's like, yeah, we're going. We're going. So, the Prophet, he bought a group of companions. And keep in mind, yani, the Prophet gave them the option. It wasn't mandatory for you to go. But he took a group of 1,400 companions. And uh, they, took, they didn't take weapons with them. But they took like sheaths that travelers would take so that they can defend themselves. So basically, just self-defense weapons. Right? Uh, in case you like, so if you like were treated by a robber or something, or like, uh, essentially you could deal with them. And that's what they took. Now, eventually, Quraysh heard of this. And uh, they, they needed to stop the Prophet So they sent a group of, they sent Khalid ibn Walid with his cavalry. They sent him to the entrance, where generally the people from Medina come. And they said, stop him by any means. Khalid ibn Walid waited and uh, khalas, him and his army, they're waiting. And this is Khalid ibn Walid, mind you. Now, when the Prophet heard that they're stopping him, the Prophet got annoyed. And I'm coming, and I'm not going to war. And yeah, they probably know that I don't have weapons. So they saw, and the Prophet started consulting. By the way, you'll realize, every single lesson so far, I've said the word consult. Ashura, Ashura, Ashura. Always consult the people around you. But here the Prophet, he consulted the companions. And then he said, all right, here's what we're going to do. Uh, one of them said, I know a way into, Medi uh, into Mecca that not many people know about. And it's very effective. And it's through an area called Hudaybi. I was like, all right, take us through it. The, like, uh, the companions, the Muslims, they started going to, and it's a very treacherous, like it's not a common route. And that's why they generally, not a lot of people know about it. It's very tiring. But once they got to the gates of Medina, Khalas, uh, Mecca, sorry. Uh, khalas, once we enter, keep in mind, Mecca, there's like a border around Mecca, you're not allowed to fight in it. Once you enter into that border, no one is allowed to fight with you. And Khalas, this is known between the Arabs. And it's, 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 and it's a sunnah, and, you, know, you can't fight unless it's self-defense. You can't fight inside Mecca. So, the air, so Quraysh knew that if the Prophet entered, it's, it's done. We can't do anything. They're going to do Umrah, and we're done. So, once the Prophet reached the border of Mecca, all of a sudden, the camel that the Prophet was on sat down. And the Prophet tried moving it. It's not moving. Sahaba tried moving it. They tried pushing it. He's not moving. What's something we said about the Prophet's camel? We mentioned it before. We mentioned it in the first... Uh, we mentioned it when the Prophet entered Mecca, Medina. What is it? It's guided. Ma'mura. It's guided. 
us once it sat down, that means Allah wants us to camp here. See, yeah, Rasulullah, yani the, if we stand here, they could fight us. It, the, the border is right there. Him up, Muna. We're camping here. So, when now Quraysh, they learned that they actually flanked them and that they went through Hudaybiyah. Taban, they panic. Khas, because he's going in. Quraysh, with all of their cavalry and everything, they rush towards Hudaybiyah. And once they reach there, the Muslims, they're camped right outside the border. Wait, wait, wait. Why? You could have just entered and they camped there at least. So they knew that they weren't here to fight. They knew that something weird was going on. So Quraysh, they camped on the other side. And they're like, alright, let's see the deal with these Muslims. Maybe they're not here to fight. Maybe they're actually here to make peace. We'll see. We'll see. So the Prophet, so, sorry. So Quraysh, they started sending a lot of envoys. And I'm not going to lie to you, all of them were very, uh, يعني, not, not a lot of them like went well. They would send a man, he'd come, he'd beef with a few Muslims, and then he'd come back. They'd send a man, he'd beef with a few Muslims, and he'd come back. The only notable one that I'm going to mention is by a man named Urwa ibn Mas'ud. And the problem, by the way, every single time one of these men will come, the Prophet is like, no, this guy's uh, he's here to cause problems. But Urwa ibn Mas'ud, when he came in, he sat with them, and he was also, he was trying to like annoy them, he was trying to piss them off. Uh, and for the most part, they kept their composure. But then the time of prayer came. And Arab ibn Mas'ud saw something unique. He saw them, and Arab ibn Mas'ud, I think he became a companion later on. But uh, during that time, he saw something that he found interesting. When the time of Salah came, now the, all the companions and the Prophet, they came up. The Prophet went, came to the wudu. Then he realized that the companions all stood around him. And whenever the Prophet would use the water, any water that fell down, the Sahaba, they, would, they wouldn't let it go to waste. They would take it, and they would use it. Because of their love to the Prophet. How much they love. They wouldn't... We talked about this a bunch of from the man who who kissed the Prophet's stomach during the Battle of Badr to the to the men who would encompass themselves and make sure that the Prophet wasn't getting harmed in Uhud. They, they loved the Prophet. So they wouldn't even the water that would come out from his wudu, they wouldn't let that go to waste. And when he saw this, he, he came up, he went back to the camp, and he said, Look. I have seen how the how Kisra the, the people like the the people of Kisra deal with their with their king Kisra. I've seen how the the people of Caesar deal with him. I've seen how and the people of Najashi deal with. Him. And I swear to you, sorry. Uh, and he said, uh, da, 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 sorry, but never have I seen a king among the people like Muhammad amongst his companions. If he performed the ablation, they will not let the water from it fall to the ground. If he expectorate like spits. They, com they compete for, which, for, sorry, for the mucus, which they would rub on their faces. If he speaks, they would lower their voices. They will not abandon him for anything in any case. He offers you a, if he offers you a reasonable plan, and if he comes to you with peace, take it. Alright? Also, one more thing that happened, that also negotiated, showed that the one have peace, is that the people of Quraysh, uh, either they wanted to set fired or like, like they wanted to cause disruption or the, in the camp or they wanted to take one of the Muslims hostage so they can interrogate him. But either way, they sent about like 40 to 70 men to the camp to try and take him out or to cause a, a skirmish. Obviously, well, some of the Muslims, they saw them. So they encircled them. They captured all of them. And they're like, they're dead. And they were causing a problem. But the Prophet, to show them that he wanted peace, he returned all of them. Upon the, he went back and forth. Uh, da, 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 da. The Prophet's like, this isn't going to work. <laughs> this isn't going to work. So he's like, all right, we need to send a man from our side. Who should I send? Umar ibn al-Khattab? No, Umar's too... Uh, Umar's Umar. Uh, who should we send? A'udhu billahi wa rajim Uthman ibn Affan. Two reasons. Three reasons, actually. Uthman ibn Affan is one of the most compassionate Sahaba you will ever read about. Wallahi, when you read about his own biography, Wallahi, you will love it. I recommend all of you read about Uthman's biography. He's a sweetheart, mashallah. The second thing, so he's very easy in negotiation. Second thing, the people of Mecca like him. Yani, keep in mind, Uthman ibn Affan and, uh, Sof, uh, uh, and the chief of Medina, they're, they're siblings. They're, sorry, they're relatives. And they, and they like each other. Yani, they're not, uh, they don't have beef. So Uthman negotiating would be also more politically viable. And by the way, they, they offered, they told Uthman, we're, letting, we're willing to let you do Umrah, but not them. And Umar, Umar, Uthman even said, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I wouldn't go do Umrah when the Prophet's with you. Uh, and last but not least, Uthman was, he was wealthy. And he, in case he needed to negotiate anything, he could do it with his money too. 
So all of that made Uthman a perfect deli. Amal Uthman went to, went to negotiate with them, and the negotiations were pretty slow. But then the Prophet was worried, and why is it taking this long? It generally doesn't take this long. He went to check, and more or less it was mistakenly thought that Uthman had died. Taban, killing a messenger is a big no-no. You don't kill messengers. Ever. You kill a messenger, you're, you're not just declaring war, you're, yani, you're declaring that we're habit, we're, we're warring without any conditions. Yani, anything is fair game. At least with a, like a messenger, at least you have some back to back. But here you're cutting all for the communication. Here, what did the Prophet say? He said, everybody, we're going to fight. Now keep in mind, before, the Prophet would consult his people, how do we fight, what do we do, what are our strategies? He's like, no, here we're just fighting. That's an enemy. Yes, we don't have, uh, the, 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 we don't have weapons, we don't have, he's like, no, we're going to fight. Amr min Allah, we're going to fight. And keep in mind, and here, there's, you're losing. Yani you don't have proper weapons, you're against an actual army, there's no logical way you're winning. this. So what does the Sahaba do? Whenever the Prophet does this, he always does something called a pledge. He always pledged something to the Prophet. And here the Prophet was pledging for them to all die. Until you're coming, you're pledging, you're telling me, okay, Assalamu alaikum, I'm here to die. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. The Prophet went under a tree. He's like, all of you, one by one, you come, you pledge death to me. It's called the pledge of Ridwan or Ba'at al-Shajar. We're, we're going against them. They're, they've killed our messenger. So, Minus the fact that the Sahaba, they're, they're not, yani they know they're going to lose. But there's still every single one of them going one by one to the Prophet ﷺ and pledging to die. We're going to fight. And then at the very end, all of them except for one hypocrite. He would always just go around like some red camel, just to pretend like he's in the line. But... So all except for one hypocrite, pledged death to the Prophet ﷺ. And then at the very end, the Prophet did this. And he said, this is the pledge of Uthman. No more honorable pledge. Yani there's not a pledge that's more honorable than that. The Prophet is pledging for you. So Uthman ibn Affan, yani, because again, if he was there, he would have pledged to the Prophet. But he was there negotiating. He's the reason we're even pledging in the first place. And here, the Muslims, they began preparing to battle. Khalas, they're ready. We're going to die. Assalamu alaikum. Here, Quraysh heard about this. They're like, ah, <laughs> he's alive. He's alive. He's alive. He's good. Well, He's perfect in good condition. No, no fighting needed. And then they're like, alright, no, these guys, they're not, yani, they're, here to, they're here for peace. And if we're more annoying, we might not get what we want. And given what uh, yani, Urwa ibn Mas'ud said, they're not here to fight. They don't want to fight. So they sent a man. Uh, Sahl ibn Sahrullah. Oh yeah, Zahil ibn Amr, yeah, Zuhail ibn Amr, sorry. And once the Prophet saw him, he's like, Zuhail, Sahil Allahu Amrakum. Also, the wordplay, mashallah. But Zuhail was the man that Quraysh would send whenever they wanted to get negotiations done. So, once he saw him, he's like, Khalas, they're here to negotiate. Zuhail came, he's like, alright, let's discuss terms. Taban, Zuhail sat, and the Prophet... He brought Ali ibn Abi Talib and they began discussing their terms. Four terms that they agreed on. First of all, the Muslims shall return back this year. Right? And they will come next year. And they wouldn't do Umrah this year, they would do it next year. And Quraysh would provide them with protection and they wouldn't uh, fight them. First one. Second one. We would have peace. We wouldn't fight. There would be an arms treaty between the two of us. Alright? And we wouldn't fight for 10 years. And anyone who wants to join our side, they're welcome to. Anyone who wants to join your side, they're welcome to. Second. Third. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, that's the third one. The second and third. The second one is that we wouldn't fight. Third one, whoever wants to join, they can. Fourth. If anyone from Mecca wants to go to Medina, they can't. If anybody from Mecca wants to leave Mecca and join the, the companions in Medina, they can't. But if anybody wants to leave Medina and go to Mecca, they can't. Especially that fourth one and that first one too. How they're like, why, why? Why don't we do it this year? And why why can they go to you and we can't they can't come to us? Like, no. Barbie's like, we agreed all four terms. And the companions are like, Ya Rasulullah. Yeah. Like, we agreed all four terms. Like, alright, let's write it down. 
So and they began writing it down. So, so on one side it was Suhail. The other side it's the Prophet and the Prophet brought Ali ibn Abi Talib so he can write for him because the Prophet can't write. So Ali began, he's like, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The, 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 the name ar-Rahman came with the Quran. Ar-Rahman al al-Quran. So, the, so Quraysh, they didn't know the name ar-Rahman. They're like, why did you write ar-Rahman? We don't know ar-Rahman. It's not a name that we have. Taban Ali, he's like, I wrote it. He's like, no, don't write it. Remove it. He's like, I can't remove the name of Allah. You just started and there's already beef. And they started, and Ali started getting mad. And the Prophet said, خلاص, remove it. He's like, Ya Rasulullah, but it's the name of Allah. He's like, where is it? Because the Prophet can't read. He's like, it's here. The Prophet took his hand, smudged it. He's like, خلاص, continue. And then Ali continued. He's like, he wrote both of their names. He wrote, this is what Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, agreed to with Suhail ibn Amr. He wrote the Messenger of Rasulullah. And then Suhail came again. <laughs> He's like, if I, knew I was, if I knew you were the Prophet or the Messenger of Allah, I wouldn't have fought you. He's like, don't write the Messenger of Allah. Well, Ali again, he's like, I'm not removing. I'm not, huh? Prophet's like, remove it. He's like, where is it again? Smudged. I'm the Prophet. The Prophet knows, he knows how to pick his battles. If I'm going to fight with them over what name am I going to write? Khalas, bismillah, khalas. That's more than enough. If uh, Rahman Rahim causes problem, I can just write Bismillah. And this is where you need to learn to pick your battles. Because Wallahi, people now, they will find the smallest, minute thing that, yani, that they can deal with and they start a, yani, hours of discussion. And, ya akhi, tab, yani, let it go. You know what? Yani, is there more harm in you just continuing or just letting it go? And Wallahi, yani, people really don't know how to do this nowadays. You don't know how to pick your battles. If you see something you don't like, yani, masa, Wallahi, how many clubs on campus are there right now that we can't, yani, we don't like? Do we go and like, you know, destroy the rooms and like, خلاص, if I go and do that right now, I'm causing more harm to myself. Yes, I don't like it, but خلاص, I can deal with it in other ways. And we'll see that with Surah al in a second. There's other ways for you to actually win your battles. So pick your battles very يعني, strategically. خلاص, now that they wrote that, they began writing the terms. Just as they began writing the terms, they hear a commotion outside, sorry. They heard a commotion outside. A man named Abu Jandal, a man named Abu Jandal, he was, a, he, was a, he was part of Quraysh and he, he, he had embraced Islam, but he couldn't go to Mecca. So when he heard that, so Medina, so when he heard that the Muslims came to Mecca and then Hudaybiyah, he's like, now's my chance, I'll go to them. Halas, I'll go to, and they'll take me back to Mecca. Or Medina, sorry. So, when he got to the Muslims, he, he ran to them, and he got to their side, and خلاص, he's there. Taban, uh, so Suhail so, so, so saw this, and he came, and he's like, are you going to honor your treaty? Taban, uh, the Prophet saw this, and he's in a dilemma. He just agreed to it. He just agreed anybody who comes to Medina, they would return him. But yani, Safwan just came. Tab, yani, Safwan, yani, hina Abu Bakr came, he's like, Pop, we, didn't, yani, we didn't agree to it yet. We we'll agreed to it after, yani, we didn't write it down yet. Well, Safwan, he's like, what is, yani, I thought you guys honored your word. Is your word not more honorable? Taban, the Prophet's like, uh, yeah, it is. Return him. Taban, this was a big blow to the Muslims. Safwan, he doesn't, he doesn't understand, he doesn't know about the treaty, but he's being dragged back. And he's like, Yani, I came to you guys, they're, they're challenging me, they might return me to be a kafir again. Taban, the Prophet, he, he was filled with sympathy, but yani, he, he agreed to something. And he said, uh, yani, he said, be patient, resign yourself to the will of Allah, and Allah will provide for you and your helpers uh, and your helpless companions relief and means for escape. Keep in mind, the Prophet's been dealing with this for 13 years. Halas, the pain of being a Muslim it's always going to be there. It's always going to be a brother or sister somewhere who are always struggling because of their faith. It is up to us to help them where we can. Even if it's with a simple word. Yes, we can't help our brothers and sisters in Palestine. That's unfortunate. And the same thing, the Prophet could have helped them here. He agreed to a treaty. Because that didn't mean that the Prophet didn't care about them. So they went back, they wrote the treaty, they agreed to it. Assalamu alaikum, and now we're heading back. Abu Bakr couldn't stand the street. He couldn't, he just couldn't. Huh? Omar, Omar ibn Khattab, my man. Omar couldn't stand the street. 
He came to the Prophet and he said, Are you not the true messenger of Allah? And he's mad. The Prophet's like, Yes. He's like, Are we not on the path of righteousness? Aren't we the Muslims? Aren't they the, like, the wrongdoers? The Prophet's like, Yes. Then why should we suffer the humiliation? We've been humiliated. We're not entering the city. This treaty is on their and it's benefiting them more than it's benefiting us. Why are we doing this? And then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, I am the true messenger of Allah, and I never disobey him, he shall help. Umar, he's, he's not getting it. The Prophet said something, he's doing it, but I don't understand why he's doing this. And this not that happen to you. Don't you read this verse in the Quran, you're like, why? 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 It's making my life harder. Or you read something in the Sunnah, you're like, why? This was given to you by the Messenger of Allah. Given to you by the Messenger of Allah. And Allah will not, and Allah shall help you. So there for a reason. Yes, you might not, and you pay money just to understand why it is. And Allah, and into when you, for instance, the sunnah of wearing shoes, you wear your right shoe, and then you wear your left shoe, and when you're removing it, you remove your left shoe, and right shoe. Why? I couldn't tell you. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. Because that's what it, yeah, well, that's what it's written. And that's what we do. But, and that's where we need to find that balance between faith and spirituality. Where yes, there's things in our faith that we struggle with. But we have our spiritual self that's like, alright, I, I don't know, I don't get it. But one day I might, and I'm doing it for the sake of Allah. And uh, Omar, يعني, he went, and, and we see this with Abu Bakr. Because Omar, he still wanted, يعني, he just wanted, because I, like, I'm not crazy, right? He went to Abu Bakr, he's like, يعني, are you like what do you think? And Abu Bakr he said he's never been a Siddiq. Sadaqt. Khalas, I trust him. I trust him. Taban, when this all finished Omar, but he said, yani, he told the Prophet, didn't you tell us that we'd be yani, that, that we do pilgrimage this year? And then the Prophet said, he, he said, oh, sorry, wouldn't didn't you promise us we do pilgrimage? He's like, I didn't promise that we do it today. Taban, he said, yani, didn't you tell us that we shave our heads? He's like, Khalas, shave your heads. <laughs> Shave your heads. Come on, the Prophet, he told them to shave their heads, but not a single Muslim got up. Because if you shave, khalas, once you shave, that's it, you head back. And they didn't want that. They, they, they felt humiliated. They, felt, they didn't want to go back for here. But when the Prophet said this, and he saw that none of them got up, the Prophet was both worried and he was mad. He was mad because they didn't listen to him, but he was worried because if he says it again and they don't listen, he was worried that يعني, Allah's wrath would fall on him. So he went into his camp and he was annoyed. And his wife who was with him now, because again, one of his wives is always with, with him. Um Salama saw him. And she said, yani, it's, she saw something was wrong. She asked him, she told, he told her the story. And then she told him, you know, they're your companions. They follow you in everything. Lead by example. Go outside. Shave your head, they all shave their heads. SubhanAllah. Yani, always, the Prophet always consults his wives, his companions. There's always some form of consultation. So the Prophet went outside based off Umm Salama's consultation. And uh, he's like, he told the barber to come, shave my head. Khalas, then the companion saw they were like, Khalas, we're done. They started shaving and they were all so annoyed when, while they were shaving to each other. They were, yani, they were annoyed and they have the razor and they just started like hurting each other. Like, bro, yeah, my, my head, bro. But then they got back. And here we realized that the treaty wasn't what it seemed like. The treaty caused a lot of success. Again, the Muslims were annoyed. But then they realized that it was a blessing in disguise. Realize something. Quraysh are... People know these people as the ones who, يعني, who protect the house. But the Muslim... Medina has a lot of dates. And they're a good trading partner. So once they made peace, people want to trade with Medina. They have a lot of dates. يعني, it's, it's a good form of wealth. So now there's a lot of trade coming into Medina. And all of a sudden, after this treaty, the people of Medina, keep in mind, they would put rocks on their stomach and tie it because of how hungry they are. And all of a sudden, they're not hungry. All of a sudden, they're able to يعني, deal with people. They realize people are asking them about Islam before. They're like, oh, these are our enemies, these are us. But now that there's peace, oh, 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 I'm so sorry. Uh, I, I, my bad. There's one th more thing I forgot to mention. In their treaty, remember how I told you that... Um, they got. They could have tribes on either side. The uh, Muslims they took. Uh, they took uh, Khuza on their side. So Khuza was an ally of the Muslims. Banu Bakr was an ally of uh, Quraysh. So the Muslims took Khuza. Banu Bakr took uh, Quraysh. It's a very important detail. I forgot to mention it. I'm really sorry. 
Um, but, but now, Muslims found themselves that they're getting a lot of trade. But after that, they realized that people are asking them about Islam because how, we're not warring with these people. Might as well know what they're on about. And now when they go to trade, people sit with them like, so, so what's this messenger you guys are talking about? And now the traders are talking about Islam. Do you know, okay, what's the most populated Muslim country in the world right now? Indonesia. How did Islam reach Indonesia? Trade. Trade, yani. Because the Indonesians, they saw these, these Arabs or these people from the Persia coming to them. They're very fair, they're very honest, they, and they have nice products. What's up with it? What, what do you guys believe in? I started learning about Islam, and subhanAllah, it's the most populated country right now of Muslims. Traders are probably the best da'is that you can find. Always, and Anna, yani most of the people that I know who converted, oh, what, what's your story? Oh, Allah, I met this person. I met, my, my friend was a Muslim. Uh, my co-worker was a Muslim. My roommate was a Muslim. You'll find that all of these come back to trade, yani, one way or another. These relationships, these day-to-day -day dealing, that's how people know about us. That's why you need to present yourself in your best character. It's minus that. The Prophet, yani, yani, but minus, yani, minus the fact that they now don't need to worry about Quraysh. Now all of their military dealings, can now get, they can now focus on the, the other confederates that were attacking them. And the Muslims realized that a lot of this treaty caused a lot of good for them. And what about that one clause that they were really annoyed about? About the Muslims not being able to uh, come to Medina. An interesting story happened. So, there was a man named uh, uh, Abu Basir. Abu Basir, sorry. Abu Basir, he escaped and he went to Medina. And the two people from Quraysh were uh, following him. So once he reached Medina, they, the people of Quraysh were like, honor our deal. I was like, yes. Sorry, Abu Basir, but you have to go with Someone, they took him, they, uh, they imprisoned him, and they were going. When they stopped at a camp, Abu Basir, he eventually got, he went free. He killed one of them, and then the other one started running towards Medina, because this man is now chasing him with a sword. So once he reached Medina, the Prophet is like, this is a man who saw death. Taban Abu Basir, he, he came to the Prophet, he's like, Khalas, you gave them back to me, let me do whatever I want. <laughs> So the man of Quraysh is like, no, you give him back to me. He's like, I already gave him back to you. You're the one who, <laughs> you're the one who uh, let him free. So Abu Basir, yani, he's like, Khalas, Ya Rasulullah, I'll leave this guy. He can go back to Medina. But you let me go. I, I, he's like, can I stay here? He's like, no. Khalas, I can't stay here, but let me do whatever I want. The Prophet's like, yeah, you're free. But so while Abu Basir was leaving, the Prophet said a word. He said, uh, He said, Woe to his mother, he would have kindled a war if there were others with him. Abu Basir heard this, and he thought of something. He went back to Mecca, but he camped outside the city. And then he started spreading the word that you can, the Muslims who have converted in Mecca, you can join me here. So now, near like a mountain, they started gathering, and a group of them, but there were a small group, and what did they, they decided, khalas. We're not part of the, the Muslims in Medina, and we're not part of Mecca. We're our own thing. And here, guerrilla warfare. They started basically going between where the like, Quraysh trade routes would come in, and they would plunder all of them. The issue with Quraysh, whenever they would prep an army so they can go and attack them, they can't because it's, 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 it's a guerrilla warfare. It's like they're Vietnam. These people, they would just jump between place to place, kind of like a gang, and then they would just plunder any trade route that they saw. So now Quraysh isn't getting any trade, nothing's leaving, nothing's coming in, they started starving. Abu Sufyan, he went to the Prophet, he's like, that fourth clause, remove it, we don't want it. <laughs> Take them. And subhanAllah, this clause that the Muslims were so annoyed about, works in their favor. So, and this is, again, this is the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I want to specify something very important here. This is a treaty. Not an alliance. There's a difference between a treaty and an alliance. I can go to an, to an enemy that I hate and be like, we're not fighting for 10 days or, an eight, or a year or 10 or what have you. But if this person's harming the Muslims, I can't come to them and tell them, ah, yes, let's trade, let's have money between us, let's do this, let's do that. And the Prophet had allegiances with non-Muslims, but they weren't harming the Muslims. The Prophet had a treaty with Quraysh, he didn't have an alliance with Quraysh. It's good to understand that difference. Especially when we look at the political state of the world today. And with those Muslims who are outside Mecca, it's also good to know that 
Yani, the Prophet didn't go and he's like, I condemn the Muslims in, uh, that are plundering the trade routes in Mecca. Taban, the Prophet condemns anybody who betrays his message and does, yani, and yani, goes against his message. But if there's somebody out there who you can't protect and they're doing their best to protect themselves, it's not up to you to come and condemn them or, well, I tell me uh, what they're doing is wrong. La, la, la. As long as they're following the message of Allah and His Messenger. They can do, it's up, it's free game to them. They don't have any allegiances, they don't have any treaties, they don't have any, they can do whatever they want. And until you give them their right, خلاص, now we can talk. And again, the manifestation of victory was very rich. I'd mentioned uh, treaties, trade, da'wah, and the Prophet started doing da'wah, like, and we'll talk about this next time, I won't go into these details, but all over the Arab world, but the other empires. And the Prophet started preparing massive armies so they can actually go fight the Confederates and he wanted to fight the Jews because they were the primary source. And the Prophet gained new followers. One day the Prophet, he was coming, he saw three Muslims walking towards him. Who are they? Well, I'll have to come next week to find them. But I do want to mention, just before I go, there is one thing I want to mention. You know, after all this, Surah Al-Fatih came out. Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. You know when this came out, the Muslims they were so happy, but the Prophet it came out, he would always stand in the night praying until his legs started to swell. Even his wife, she came to him and she's like, yani your legs, they're, uh, yani they're, they're, yani, yani, he said, Afala, akunu abdun Imam, the Prophet was a human. He was, and we see that because the Prophet, when he was coming back in one of his, uh, one of his uh, battles, he was going back to Medina, but then he took like a detour. People didn't know why. And they eventually reached like a really old grave. They, then they asked, yani, and then the Prophet, he told his army to stay back. He went, and he started crying. He started crying and... He cried so much, his beard started getting wet. Like the Ashaba, they didn't understand why. But, uh, and he, when the Prophet finally came back, they asked him, yani, what happened? The Prophet said, this is the grave of my mother. I asked Allah if I could visit her grave. And he said I could. Then I asked Allah, could I ask for her forgiveness? And he didn't let me. And here we, rise at the pro here we see two beautiful things. The Prophet's a human. He's a human who, when he remembers his mother, he cries. When he sees something that suddenly means he's sad, he sees something that's happy, he, he smiles, or when he hears a joke, he laughs. Smile is all that he's still a prophet. All of what I just mentioned, he's delegating best. He gives time to his wives and to his companions, and he's always there. Allah, I don't think I'm doing enough justice as to the character of the Prophet in these halakhas best. You don't understand that he's a human. And you know what the Prophet's mother, يعني, the reason he cried is because it's a mother. It's a mother. يعني, Musa, السلام, his, what does Allah say? يعني, so your mother would be happy. It's always that motherly love and the Prophet remembered that. Best. The, and this is said about the Prophet's mother, it's one of two things. People say that she's part of the hellfire. And the second opinion, which is stronger, is that we don't know. She's going to be tested on her own thing. On her own belief. Best. The people themselves, yani the Muslims, nobody, yani, not a single man, not a single person, can go into heaven without Allah's permission. Not even the wife's mother. And the Prophet can't control that. He's still a human. That in mind, I took a lot of your time. Sorry about that. But uh, inshallah, these are references. And these are Quranic references. So Surah Al-Nur in regards to Al-Fahisha. Surah Al-Fatih in regards to the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And Surah Al-Mumtahina, I believe... Uh, Mumtahina talked about... Um, oh yeah, Surah Al-Mumtahina talked about a few things. Uh, there's a lot of things with the treaty I didn't discuss, such as how to deal with the, the female, or like, like the female like people who were coming back and things. So, but it's mentioned too. Uh, so I'd recommend you read through them, read about their Azbab al-Nuzul, their Tafsir. There's a lot of things in those surahs that are really important for you to read about. 
With that in mind, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa anta, nasakhfiruk wa natubu ilayk. Subhanak rabbil izzati amma yasifun, wa salamun ala al-mursaleen, wa